Olivia, the ACI has been talking about airport competition for a very long time. There's a new report by Frontier Economics, um, and we've Dan with us today, which is uh, very good news. And there's also a new package that sort of takes that report and tries to pre present the case. Why are we still talking about airport competition? Well, that's a good question. I think we're still talking about airport competition because we're facing a lot of resistance from our regulators to accept the reality of the market we're in today. And that is that airports actually do compete quite a lot between each other. It, it, it does strike... I have to say, it does seem sort of counterintuitive that airports compete. I mean, airports are geographically fixed. So w let's analyse this. If you're going to talk about competitive markets, you need to analyse what is the market. So, Dan, what's the market f that airport competition I is scoped within? Where, are they, where is the competition? Well, I mean, I think there are four different markets, broadly speaking, you can think of. So the one you described is the one that people imme immediately go to, that is the, the local area. Right, which is indeed the airport they go to. Yeah, right, <laughs> of course. Yeah. But, um, and there are occasions when there are, there's more than one airport in that market. Uh, and so people leaving that destination, arriving at that destination, have a choice in that location of more than one airport. So if you like, that's a, a competition for passengers. You could say, yes. Yeah. It's certainly competition for uh, arriving or leaving a particular destination. Mm -hmm. But also it's not restricted to aviation. I mean, there are other modes of transport as well. So we, we need to be clear that in specific locations, uh, the options are, are sometimes a lot wider than just flying, depending on where you're going to, where you're coming from. You have um, uh, high-speed trains, yeah. uh, road in some on some occasions. So there are those options. I think that's the first um, go-to. Second obvious one is um, uh, for transfer traffic. Is so um, an airport hub as a uh, as a provider of transfer services so passengers coming from somewhere through the hub onto a uh, final destination the hub location is itself to a certain extent discretionary certainly for the passenger um, and the airline can choose or the airlines can choose the route that they divert passengers through so there's uh, there are different opportunities there so there's a second form of competition um, the third and I think um, probably the most important growing area of competition, and this is the thing that our report really, uh, uh, really emphasised, uh, would be um, competition for uh, marginal airline capacity. And actually, a lot of that is to do with um, is to do with airports as destinations rather than airports as point of origin. The driver of economic competition is what happens with the the. The, the, the last, if you like, the last unit, the last marginal unit of, of, of output. How is it priced? How is it? Uh, what, what are the competitive pressures over that, uh, over that unit? Because that's the thing that really drives um, behaviour. Now, at an airport, it's worth bearing in mind that airports as economic activities are high fixed cost, low variable cost activities. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very sensitive in their profits to changes in the quantity of traffic that okay. they have. So, so just to come back, because I'm not 100% convinced I've got this yet, okay. the, the marginal thing, what you mean there is one more route that an airline adds to... In this case, it, would be, it could be one more route. It could be, it, I mean, extremely, it could be as, as little as one more frequency, one more... Okay, well, right. yes, but, so but, an, yes, but another route. One and, more rotation. But, but the airport is very sensitive to pressure over that um, capacity at the margin. And that's reflected in, um, in the first instance, what we see is an increasingly dynamic airline market where we see airlines, especially low-cost carriers, being much more um, aggressive and much more nimble in the terms of the, the choosing of where they place um, new capacity in the market. They actively you know, put airports in competition with each other to fight to see where will the next new capacity go, where will it be located in Europe, and that is actually very, very big, as Olivia, I'm sure, will... Well, I'm, I'm, and, I was and, about to ask, uh, Olivia, yeah. is that a real thing? Is that a thing? Well, it's, uh, it's really what our members in Europe, airports, are going through every day. Uh, you know, that competition to attract 
airline services, and actually not just to attract airline services, but to retain airline services. And then, as Dan's saying, to build that to build the number of services that each airline offers. Exactly. And the, and that's effectively Dan your marginal yes. thing, right? Yeah. But but Libby, really good point that that of course you can you could look at it just in terms of the competition for the new next thing. Actually, it's much more intense than that. Um, we see in our, in our report sort of um, highlights this a very very considerable amount of uh, route churn so that we can look at say the number of routes that a carrier a low-cost carrier was operating in 2022 saying well how many of those routes were there op operating pre-pandemic and it's quite common to see operating the same number of routes in total but 30 40 percent of the routes are new so there is this amount of experimentation in the market which the airports are having to accommodate and fight for but also that's actually probably less than half of the actual amount of change in capacity that airports are seeing the rest is on existing routes okay so so let me let me make sure i understand this i'd love to take a airline and a airport and do it you know specifically <laughs> but you know i know that but no thanks for that but um we're, so we're talking about an airport. Let's we're in Brussels. Let's say Brussels Airport. So now we're looking at the airlines that fly to Brussels choosing to add another destination from Brussels, yeah, or, and or another destination to Brussels. I guess. So I mean, for Brussels Airlines, it's obviously outbound, but for many other airlines, it will be. Do we add Brussels to our network? Well, for all known Brussels-based airlines, well, indeed, yeah. that's yeah. the case. So and and but that's so for Brussels, there's competition to try to attract non-Brussels-based airlines to fly to Brussels. You should come to Brussels, or you should come to Brussels more often, or you should come to Brussels with bigger aeroplanes. Yeah. All, all of those is right, right. All of that. And then let's focus on the low-cost carriers just for a minute, um, because clearly for Brussels airlines, it's hard to imagine they'd, they'd base themselves somewhere else. The hint's in the name, really, isn't it? But, but for an airline that's flying... Well, I, I, would, I would challenge that, because Brussels Airlines is not as an operator on its own. It's part of a wider group, the Lufthansa okay. group. And I think when you're looking at the network decisions taken by airlines in the Lufthansa group, it's clear that those are coordinated decisions. So when the Lufthansa group decides to buy new aircraft, it then has to decide where it's going to allocate those aircraft amongst the different airlines of the group. And this is where it plays out competition between the airport base of its different airlines. Indeed, the Lufthansa Group is very famously has got Frankfurt and Munich and Zurich and Brussels as its hubs for the sort of connecting traffic that Dan, you spoke about before. Not just for the connecting traffic, also for the point-to-point -point traffic. Okay, thank you. I was trying to <laughs> stick on the connecting point point, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I agree with that. Uh, obviously, that's right. But for... So, so just to follow that for a moment, so for the Lufthansa Group, the decision, if you're thinking about Brussels, is do we put an aeroplane here, which is a decision that obviously Brussels Airport has an enormous interest in, yes. but no say over. Is that right? Does it have a say over that? Well, I think that's where we're getting to the point about how, about how competition but sort of works. Before we get to that, Dan, can you tell me the fourth group where there's competition? You said there are four. Oh, in our report, the fourth group, the fourth group is, is, is in a sense, competition for the market, which, is, which was another aspect that we identified in the report. Um, what do you mean by that? We see an increasing amount of private sector involvement in airports. I mean, go back 40 years, almost all airports were state or municipally Indeed. owned. A large proportion of them are now privately owned. Even if they're not privately owned, they're privately operated under some form of uh, uh, concession agreement. Um, and in that market for concessions, there's a strong incentive for the operators who play in that market for concessions to perform well in terms of how they actually run the airport. Not just in terms of profitability, but in terms of driving traffic, in terms of driving quality and whatever. Partly because what those operators, they're functioning in a different market. Their market, in the sense that they're functioning in, is one uh, for the operation of airports. If I were to ask, if, if IATA was in this room today, I fear that the, the, the expression they'd use is monopoly service providers. Yeah. And, and, and the DG of IATA, Mr Walsh, is on record for saying all airports want to do is gouge their, passen gouge their passengers, and that's going to be terrible because every cent counts for us, the airlines. 
monopoly service providers have we is is that myth dead yet it just well it's dead. it's it should be dead mm. and in reality it is dead if you look at the market forces so why does but, it carry but on it's not dead with the regulators yeah right so i think so that's but why is that uh, I think I think there's different things that come into play. Um, the first is that, and we've we've mentioned that earlier, intuitively when you look at an airport, you tend to think that airport is a monopolist or has monopoly power because that airport sits alone there in its territory. Yeah. You know, when you look at airlines, it's different. You always see airlines side by side, so it's it's very visible that mm. airlines compete with each other because they are, they operate yeah. side by side. You see the airplanes at the airport side by side from different airlines. When you look at the airport, it's there alone, big. So that I think perpetuates a bit the 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 impression that this is a monopoly. The second thing I think that we we are having really a challenge is changing the perception of the regulators because maybe you know what a regulator wants to do by definition is regulate if you're asking a regulator to regulate less you make the job slightly different i would say less interesting maybe mm -hmm. and i think that's that's a real challenge at the same time when you're a hammer everything and, looks and like the third hour. aspect mm -hmm. is that still and it's linked to the monopoly perception um, people assume that um, airline and passengers have the same interest and that's not the case so most a lot of regulators uh, take uh, airlines for a proxy of passenger interest oh, okay. that's when yeah. when actually that's not the case at all yeah. so what should they do well i think they should uh, look read the, the <laughs> fantastic report that dan has produced and really look at the market with fresh eyes and not um, you know, not with, with a rear view, because they're still looking at the market as if it was the market of 30, 40 years ago. If, if I may, I'd love to come back to the second point about airlines as, as proxy for passengers. Mm -hmm. But the first point, I couldn't agree more. Of, I mean, and I'll freely confess, I came into the business of looking at the economics of airports from a background of how do you regulate infrastructure? airports are transport infrastructure classic example right so you come from rail networks or uh, electricity distribution networks or gas supply networks and you say right well these are there's one network hmm. uh, and it supplies everywhere and everywhere needs to be supplied right um, and you can have competition over the network but there's one network and we develop a toolkit for regulation how you deal with this problem because right and it's quite easy then to look at what looks like a, a very dynamic market over an airport infrastructure but on that analysis each airport is a node right mm -hmm. yes but the network is quite quite different mm. to a gas supply network or, or a or a rail network for, yep. for, for a variety of reasons even though that node may be the only place that that if you like supplies that area two things is, is one is that node is not in the con is not in a monopoly control across the whole network. That node is, you know, um, Heathrow Airport, or that node is ADP, or that it's node very is very fragmented. It's, yeah. So it's fragmented. They are different. In, in, indeed, yeah. indeed, one could come to the the argument that there isn't one network. Each airline network is its own network. That's you know. right. Yeah. But also, this network is not one where every point needs to be supplied. Yeah. Right. right? It's it's one where where for some of the traffic you need to be supplied. So for your own origin, place where you live, if you need to fly, you have, a, you, you know, you maybe have one airport, although actually, a, you know, within, especially within mainland Europe, you can see that large proportion of the population in Northern Europe have access to multiple airports. So it's not do, do we have numbers for that? What sort of percentage has? Ooh, or, a quarter. I th about twenty five percent of Europeans yeah. are within X hours where X is hundred kilometres. A hundred kilometres. Okay, it's an hour's driving, two hours driving. Yeah, you know, um, but um, but the fact that the different nodes are in separate control, but also as for the reverse traffic, the destination traffic, there are actually there's lots of discretionary movement going around. There's lots of of if you like holiday traffic, for instance, that could go to one place but might go to another place. And in fact, there are the reality is always far more destinations than than actually will be served economically in an economically viable way. And this is exactly why then 
the competition over the network actually affects the network and actually affects the dynamic of the network. So it becomes a very different economic problem to the one of a pipes and wire, what we'd see as a pipes and wires business. So back to Olivier's point, where the regulators come at it with a toolkit built up from gas, electricity, water, hmm. right? They come at it looking, starting seeing something. That isn't what well, it is. It's also fair to say that it is, it's, it, it, that it was more like that 20 years mm -hmm. ago than it is now mm -hmm. because the advent of low-cost carriers, the fact that, you know, the example that the Libby game of Brussels Air Airline, you said Brussels Airlines tied to Brussels. Actually, you know, this discussion suggests, well, it's a question about how many aeroplanes Lufthansa Group chooses to paint Brussels Airlines on the side of. Mm. That there's no, <laughs> they could move them around, so it's sort of, there isn't, it's become much more dynamic and, and no one is as fixed to place yeah. in that market as they used to be. Well, thank you. But this serves me right because I shouldn't have said that about Brussels Airlines, <laughs> should I? Um, because I, but what I do want to start to probe a little bit is the difference between the full service carriers, the, the long haul network carriers versus the low cost carriers and the extent to which, I mean, I, I, I wholly accept there's competition between those two groups at an airline level, there's an increasing amount of competition between those two groups at an airline level. Is there competition between airports looking at each of those two groups, if you see what I'm saying? Is there an airport that says, we're going to, fo Heathrow, we're going to focus on the long haul guys and the network guys, and, and then there are other airports, Chalwa, for example, that says we're going to focus on the low cost carriers? Well, I think, I think the lines are blurring there, clearly, mm -hmm. because we've seen low cost carrier airlines, you know, moving into primary airports. Mm -hmm. Uh, cl clearly, yeah. and you're seeing those larger airports being very keen on attracting low-cost airlines because especially in the wake of the pandemic and the recovery from it, you can see that most of the growth is coming from low-cost carriers. Mm. So is that they are the ones putting capacity in the market. So as an airport, if you want to recover from COVID-19, and because you're, you're depending on growth and volumes, as, as rightly uh, Dan said earlier, you have no choice. You're going to have to go after also the low-cost airlines, even if you're a capital airport or a big airport. Is there any continuing use to talk about primary airports and secondary airports? Is that a, a weird distinction that we should get rid of? I think it's not that simple either. I think the lines are blurring, but I think what you have is very different realities, uh, you know, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, at the same time, I think what we're seeing is the, the network carriers following the lead, so to speak, of, of the local skiers and replicating the way they uh, look at the business of developing the network and, and the way they relate to airports. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're seeing now, and this is something we get now from all of our members, is that airlines are running beauty context. You know? Are they? They are. You know, we, we, we've seen letters, standard model letters, sent by airlines to 70, 50 airports telling them, I'm planning to have that and that aircraft coming to my fleet next year and the year after. I'm going to decide where to allocate those aircraft based on the best offer you're going to make me. So we, we've got to the point of how is it that this competition manifests itself, right? Is, is it by being very well painted and having comfortable chairs? That'd be a nice innovation. Um, and, and a few things like that. I mean, how do the airports compete one against the other? Well, it's, it's incentive and rebates to airlines. Money. So money. money. But it's not just money. And I think increasingly also service quality and efficiency of operation is playing an increasingly important role. Is that two things or one thing, service quality and efficiency of operation? Depends if you're an economist. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that, didn't I? I absolutely walked into that. I mean, uh, <laughs> but I think it comes down to the, the airlines having different yeah. expectation and needs. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Quality, in the, quality in the sense that you might uh, expect purely in terms of, well, in the, you described the niceness of the environment for, for, the, for the passenger, you know, or the quality of the, 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 the shops artworks, or the, the artworks. Yeah. That, the five-star you know, airport. This, 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 is, this is part of the... This is part of it and matters more for some airlines than other airlines. And then quality in the economist sense of well, any service, if you like, aspect of the service which impacts on the profitability of the airline. So the ability to provide the airline with the service that it wants and needs in terms of, you know, 
the right parking gate, the ability to, you know, the, 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 the right taxi times to get off the stand and onto the runway, the ability to get that uh, aircraft on the stand, turned round and off again in, within the, 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 the timetables that the airline expects. Let me put that back into non-economist speak, if I may. Um, if, well, let me see if I can. Uh, the, the airlines... An airline like, for example, Ryanair makes, and all the other low-cost carriers, I hasten to add, makes a big play on the fact that their turnaround times are really tight and, the, and it, fundamental to their business model is the speed of getting the aircraft from, you know, it's, as far as, the, as, far as the, the low-cost carriers are concerned, it's not gate to gate, it's cruise to cruise. The issue is how quickly can you get through the airport. So for an airport to attract a low-cost carrier or to keep on attracting low-cost carriers, they have to say, we have got really efficient systems that allows your aircraft to park, get unloaded, get reloaded, and get out again, exactly. right? Which of course means that airports in very crowded places with a lot of air traffic control issues and so forth already get into problems there, I, I'm guessing, but leave that aside for a minute. But then for some airlines like Emirates or Qatar or whoever, what they want is this, an experience for their passengers that is consistent with the model, or, you know, the, the experience they're projecting yeah. Um, in their advertising and, and everything else and, you know, the plushness of the seats and the depth of the shag pile, carpet and all those sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. But given those two things, how important then is actually the price? Uh, I think that's, that's really the, the reality of the market today. The first thing the most airlines will look at is, is the price. Right. So it's those letters that you were talking about where airlines have said we've got two new aircraft, or 20 new or aircraft, 20 new aircraft. where should we put them? Yeah. A lot of that is how much are you going to charge me or yes. not charge me? Yes. yes, I mean, actually, and so what you've got in that is a negotiation between airline and airport where, you know, the airline has very, very substantial buyer power. Massive market Massive, power. I would say, yeah. Well, I'm be careful about the use of market power, but but they have they have substantial buyer power just because they are they're a very very substantial buyer and they have a leverage the airport doesn't have. It's exactly your point about Brussels Air airline is true of Brussels Airport. Mm. Is that Brussels Airport is where it is. The air, the airline doesn't have to put planes there. Yeah. Put their planes anywhere. I mean, when you're an airport, you're stuck in the location where you are. You can't move to a more competitive market location. <laughs> you just need to work on making your own location competitive to attract the airlines. And, and that realistically comes down often to price, doesn't it? Primarily. And, and, to what, and you said earlier on, Olivia, you said price and rebates. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same the thing. Same thing, isn't it? It's <laughs> the same thing. It's the same thing to some extent, it, don't it, you it, think? It, it is, it is yeah? part of the same thing, yes. Mm. yes. I mean, it's an interesting point about um, pricing flexibility. At airports. I mean, Olivia will know that one of the um, issues that airports have faced, especially often smaller airports, subject to some form of economic regulation, is that regulators are very uncomfortable about um, not just worrying about the level of, of airport charges, but very uncomfortable about the structure of charges. Um, and an absolute key thing to growing an airport uh, is the incentive structure for how an airport charges to encourage new routes, new traffic, and the economics of it is, is very, very clear. It's a high fixed cost, low variable cost business. It has to try and recover its fixed costs as it, as it best can. The, 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 the rational, this sort of profit, profitable thing to do is to um, charge lower prices for new business, which is l less certain, more price sensitive, whatever, for a while in order to build up that traffic, in other words, to provide incentives. And what we've seen is regulators, without necessarily having an overarching, a, a real sort of understanding what's going on, resisting the idea that airports should engage in commercial pricing mm. in order mm. to encourage um, more traffic. Well, airlines, when they give incentive schemes, it's all to do with volume. Yeah. The more volume you give us, the lower the, 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 lower the price will be. But, but let's move on to regulators and regulation, because in Europe, the, 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 the regulation is the airport charges directive. Is it a perfect piece of legislation? I think it's a, it's a pretty good piece of legislation in, in the sense that it allows then 
each market to decide how it wants to regulate its airports. I mean, you have common principles, mm -hmm. uh, transparency, consultation, having an independent regulator, which are, of course, principles we agree and support. But I don't think that what you need is more regulation at EU level. Right. Because what we are we risking more regulation at EU level? Uh, well, this is what the airlines are asking, especially IATA. Mm -hmm. They want more stringent, tight regulation onto airports decided at EU level from Brussels. And, uh, you know, the kind of reality we've just discussed in terms of what is the reality of the market shows that actually, I think the regulatory level is best suited to be local, mm -hmm. to have a sense of really what is happening in the market locally. And that view, you're not going to get it from Brussels. Uh, but the problem is that we need national regulators to switch in terms of mindset and accept the reality that we've just discussed. So it's an education process as much as it anything is, it in, is, in the, it is. At, a local, at a local, meaning national. At actually. a national level. And I think this is where actually the European Commission has a role to play, to take together the national regulators towards evolving their thinking, being more market driven and reflect what is the reality of the market we're in today. But also and that's, that's, that's clearly the role for me of the Urban Commission, rather than bluntly revising the, the, the airport charges directive and transforming it, transforming it into a regulation. But it's not, is it not also, though, the role of the ACI to help educate national regulators? Well, that's regulators. what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is yeah. you know, I think what Dan's study is doing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our contribution to the debate uh, we realize it has a lot to do with expertise of the people in charge and uh, changing the culture, the mentality, uh, opening up the eyes of, about the market. Uh, and that's, that's what we're working on. Is it also, though, opening up the eyes of and changing the culture of the airlines? Well, I think, I think it, it depends who you're talking to in an airline. Right. Because if you're talking to the people who are into operations, into dealing with airports, I think they would recognize that the airport competition is there because that's what, well, that's what they're driving, yeah. you know, in deciding the network and everything. But if you talk to the regulatory people or the policy people in the airline, uh, the mindset is, well, we want to get a continuous uh, pressure, downward pressure on airport charges because this is in the interest of our business to pay the, the smallest possible price for the use of the infrastructure. But isn't that what competition does? I mean, isn't that, isn't that why we're doing the competition well, thing? They, they want more than, than what competition does, especially at larger airports. Well, and indeed we saw Heathrow recently reduce its charges and the front page of the Financial Times said because of airport lobbying. Well, not only that, but it's the fact that it's oh. never enough. Well, <laughs> for the no, I'm sure, I'm sure it's it never enough. Zero. It comes down to the fact that for decades, um, airports were all publicly owned, publicly yeah. run, and the mission given by states to the airport was you take care of my national carrier. Mm -hmm. And airports were consistently used as an instrument of indirect subsidization of the national carrier. Mm -hmm. And that's a model, of course, the airlines tend to regret because as you transform the, airline, the airports, you corporatize them, you privatize them, you ask them to do their own, to, to finance their own investment, of course the users need to pay more. Of course, there's a certain it's, amount of selective, pays, there's a certain amount of selective amnesia there as well, isn't there? Because the airlines used to be state-owned and their job was to protect the interests of the state and the country and make sure it was connected and what have you. And that's, that's gone away, but they don't like it. They don't like it when the other team gets this sort of stuff. 10, 15 years ago, we'd have talked, a lot of this conversation would have used, would have been about state aid. Mm -hmm. Are we past that? We've passed that, uh, also because a lot of more of airports are privately owned and, or privately, privately operated. Privately exactly. Operated, yeah, exactly. So that kind of defeats the whole debate about, about state aid. And also because, uh, uh, you know, I think states are less and less inclined to, to finance airport infrastructure being for, you know, investment cost or operating cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone through the global financial crisis and we've gone through COVID, so, you know, uh, public budget have been depleted and there's, yeah. there's less money around. Yeah. Hospitals, schools, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's an important point to be, to, be, uh, to be looked at is, you know, the impact on consumers mm. and who benefits the most from airport competition. 
Who benefits the most from airport competition? Well, I think in the first place it's the airlines because they are the ones who are going to pay less for the use of the infrastructure thanks to that airport competition. Although we've already said that they don't think it'll be less enough. And there are an assumption, especially enough from is. regulators, that the lower the airport charges, the lower the airfares. And, is, and this is wrong. Right. I mean, come on, tomorrow, if an airport would stop charging airlines, do you think the airline would give its, its tickets to the consumers for free? No. I think, you know, there's no one-for-one -one relationship between lower airport charges and the level of airfares, not at all. What drives airfares is the level of competition between airlines on mm -hmm. any given route. Yeah. And we have 60% of Europe's air routes that are operated by one single airline. Really? So I think, you know, along with all what we're saying and the way we're trying to educate and open the eyes of the regulators, I think some regulators should sometimes look at the airline side as well. Mm -hmm. And because there, there, are, there is monopoly power on the airline side as well. I mean, the, you know, I... Don't tell me you don't uh, agree. I know there are, there, are is, there are issues of concentration on airline routes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's undoubtedly a complex relationship between airport charges and, um, airfares. and airfares. I mean, uh, in the first instance, Olivier is absolutely right. The air, an airport is effectively you know, a wholesaler of landing, of, of landing services to an airline. It's not quite, it's a more complicated relationship than that with the passenger. There's obviously, they obviously have a direct relationship with the passenger as well, but this is what we're discussing. They're providing services to airlines. They're the, prime, they're the first order beneficiary. Competition between airports does reduce costs, all things being equal, improve quality of service, and that leads to a better aviation travel market and some combination of service quality, price, or whatever, you would expect that to benefit the traveling yeah, public. Yeah. No, it does. They will, of course, it will that, through. That, yeah. It's complicated, not one for one, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the share of, co of airport cost in an airline service mm -hmm. is very variable depending on what kind of service you're offering. If you're offering a really premium long haul service, it's you know, very long distance service, it could be quite a small proportion of the ticket fare. If you're offering a relatively short, short haul low cost service actually it could be a it will be a larger proportion mm. but mm -hmm. you know 15 percent 20 percent maybe i mean okay. it'll vary it as you rightly said Andrew, very very big variation in ticket fares um right because an awful lot of price discrimination goes on at the airline level so describing as a proportion of any given ticket is really difficult but there will be there'll be some um there'll be some feed through just going to make a note of that, as you rightly said. I know. It's <laughs> don't, don't weird help. experience. <laughs> <laughs> weird experience. Let me move on again. What's the interplay between airport competition and slots? Is there an interplay between airport competition and slots? I think the slot debate is, is of course, linked to charging and the economics of the airport. Indeed. Because the slots which rules brings us to competition, doesn't decide it? the speed at which you can run your airport in terms of the capacity and its usage. Mm. And I think it's been a big frustration for, for us that, you know, we've had very little influence or say in the way the rules relating to slots are being developed and are being applied. And that's why we're very interested and very keen on seeing the European Commission looking at yeah. the EU slot regulation, which is what 20, 25 years old, yeah. uh, and uh, and actually ensure that airports have more say in in slots rules because that that really dictates uh, you know uh, as it dictates the way our capacity is used it really also have a big influence on our economics. And so putting that the other way around, by liberalising slots to some extent, giving an airport more say in the slots process, we open the opportunity for more inter airline competition at an airport. At a very congested airport, the the slot is the it's it's your it's your right to land in a or take off in a given window. Well, both, but yeah. Well, like and you'll generally need two <laughs> for it to be worthwhile. It's always good to remember, Dan, that taking <laughs> off is optional, but landing is mandatory. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you need that right, and that right is currently you know held by the air, airline that 
that, that has what we, we call grandfather rights over that slot. They've been operating it, so they're allowed to operate it as long as they, as long as they like. Um, that creates a substantial rigidity in the market at that very congested airport. And it means that you can, over time, get a big sort of like um, a dislocation between the, um, the commercial interest of the individual airline that holds those slots and, and what a sort of effective uh, aviation market might deliver in that location. And without some more thought about liberalising that slot regime, um, it, it's very hard to see how you'll get more, um, uh, you know, you'll, 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 you'll create more sort of like dynamic competition at that sort of well, airport. And, and because also, you know, what we're asking for is to look at how efficient the regime is until in terms of the use of the existing capacity, because actually the regime we have today results quite in some wasted capacity. Mm. Mm. So if you have more capacity at an airport, it's it's linked to more competition between airports I as mean, well. I would almost say actually that actually yeah. even before I I'd say, given the capacity crunch that certainly we were facing before the pandemic, and no doubt we will be facing again probably sooner than we before expect. Before too long. <laughs> yeah. Sooner yeah. than we expect. Mm. Um, the efficient use of the capacity we have is, is of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. And with this very inefficient way of allocating the capacity, um, we just aren't getting the best out of what we have. Exactly. So simply getting exactly. the best out of what we have, exactly. then using good economic signals to say, well, do we need more? So in, until you're using what you have effectively, you can't be sure you need more because expanding airport capacity, we know, is a very contentious issue. Indeed. Even so if when we, we think we need more, it's going to be awfully hard to get more, isn't but, it? But knowing, you know, really having the right, the right, ec the right economic signals in there, so that we we, we really know that that it's that there's value to be gained from from the expansion. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's um, that's that's a key part of it. So the, again, the slot regime is is undoubtedly uh, uh, part of the story at the uh, at the congested airports. Yeah, right, and. But for uncongested airports, non-congested airports, whatever the correct expression there is, it's we're back to the competition. I think we're back to the competition, aren't we? For for an airport that sits somewhere, it has capacity un unused. What it's desperately trying to do is encourage airlines to fly to it more so than encouraging passengers to come to it or it's the airline that draws the passengers is yes it? Yeah. yes i mean no one's ever no one's ever said I, I think i'm you know i'm a bit thirsty i'll go to the airport to have some beer but you know sometimes when you're at the airport and waiting you'll have some beer you know i mean that, that's the argument the airlines always use that that but for us the airlines there'd be no reason to have airports and therefore you should give us everything for free Am I summarising that correct? That's my memory of what the airlines usually. It's more or less. That's more or less. It's 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 a particular take on how they <laughs> how they put the, put it. But yes, more or less true. And clearly, what is not the case is, is that there's a that when Ryanair, for the purpose of argument, say we might place an aircraft in Warsaw or we might place an aircraft in Lyon, yeah. pick random places. I don't yeah. know. Um, that they that they can that they imagine there's a bunch of pa passengers out there waiting for to see where where this particular um, uh, air, literal physical aircraft is going to go. I'm going to go and fly on that aircraft. No, it's that's not that that isn't what's happening. They don't have captive passengers in that sense. What they know is that there is a there is a very very large fluid market demand out there where they can say, well, if we decide, you know, we're flying from. Dublin or wherever, we want to take passengers to a range of places. We offer a range of places. This year we offer this range. Next year we're going to offer a different range. And, cre and we cr mediate that demand. Yeah. So there is a demand out there to travel. Some of it is obviously un indisputably fixed. You know, if I, I'm in London and I want to come and visit you, I have to come to Brussels. I can't choose to go to Madrid and say, well, hmm. Olivier, why aren't you here? <laughs> right? Um, but, um, but there will be occasions when I'm in London saying, well, where will I go? Yeah, which I, which, where, of, these where, which of these options will I choose? Yeah. And realistically, you know, actually the mediators of that are the airlines, not the air, yeah. 
and court in the first instance, what are the options I'm being offered? I think it's important to stress that in, in the past pandemic era, where we're seeing business travel now returning to the level that it used to be, and where demand is increasingly driven by leisure travel, exactly. that part of the market is becoming ever more important. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And you so, so let me just sort of see if I can wrap this up. Four categories of competition. The first one is two airports in the same place trying desperately to attract. That's one version. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, passengers with an option with with a range of options that they can use. The traditional. The traditional model. The, the traditional model, if you like. Although, is I mean, is that the traditional airport competition model? I'm not sure. I, the, the second model is is the airlines. The, the airport's trying to attract an airline to, to fly to and from it. And that's where I think that's where the, the, the letters you were talking about come in, that they're saying desperate. We, we, are, we are open to flying to a bunch of places. Make, you, make yourself more attractive. Yeah. The third group then was the um, can I, I I'm, I'm going to fly from point A to point C or, or exactly. point D, whether I fly over B or C to get to D. Yeah doesn't really, you know, I'm, I'm almost neutral about, except you're not, of course, because you, if you choose to fly on an airline, which as a customer is what you do, as a passenger, you choose this airline, then you're going to be driven through that hub. Sure. Aren't you? But, but is there but evidence the of passengers of... saying, wait a minute, I prefer to fly over hub A than hub B? Yes, of course. Is there? Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, there, firstly, there is that, but also it's a very, that is a very price se sensitive segment of the market. Right. And actually, you can, you can tell that it's a very price sensitive segment of the market, because if you look at um, airport charges, you'll see that many, if not most, major hub airports now offer a lower uh, passenger charge for a transfer passenger than for what we call an origin destination passenger, one who's either starting or finishing their journey at that airport. So it's reflecting, the co it's not a cost thing, it's got to do with the fact that they're, that they're under more price, they're more, it's a more price sensitive market, and so they'd have to simply charge less for it. When you started saying that, I thought you were, <laughs> that, you, that, that I thought you were going to say, it doesn't mean you were going to say it, uh, but I thought you were going to say that, that the airports really want transfer passengers. Oh, well, both the airports and the airlines do want transfer well, passengers. Well, I mean, I think we're going to assume that any passengers they want you want a combination of direct passengers and connecting passengers because what you're actually wanting to do is you're wanting to fill aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. So you're actually engaging in a, a, an act of, uh, uh, of, of, of combining different sorts of travellers together to make the maximum use of your assets. That's true for the airline and it's true for the, true yeah, for the airport as well. So it's in both airport and airline's interests to have a mix of direct passengers and transfer passengers. I mean, that's your third. We were yeah. in th okay. four models of competition. Yeah, that was three. Okay. <laughs> and number four again? Number four is the market for corporate control. The market with. for corporate control. Thank you. If, effectively, being a good investment target, for want of a better way to put it. Being a, actually being demonstrably a good investor. Okay. Thank you. That's a much better way to put it. I'm really impressed by how much you guys know about the airline business. You, you can see what the airlines need to do and how they need to operate. Do you think the airlines have the same understanding of the airport business? I think they do. They I do. think they do. But I think it, it comes back to the dichotomy I was mentioning mm. earlier. You know, it depends who you're talking to with an, an, an airline, yeah. and it depends who the airline is talking to. Right. Which then, of course, also brings us to the regulator point, doesn't it? Because the, the airlines talk to the regulators. Is it the right person from the airline That's talking to the regulators? But it's interesting because you see now discrepancies coming a bit out in the, in the public domain. I mean, you have those, those quotes from a major network airline, its annual report, where the airline recognises that it is increasingly able to play the competition between airports and allocate its resources flexibly on a pan-European basis. Uh, but at the same time, when that airline goes to its regulator, you know, it's the oh, mindset yes. is this is the monopoly you need to regulate. We need a downward pressure on airport charges. And that's it. So the bottom line, I think, in all of this is we need better informed regulators. We need we need a, a broader, richer conversation around all of this. And that's what you're driving at with both Dan's report and then and then your sort of campaign and, and the other supporting documents that you're going to put out. We need to bring airport regulation into the 21st century. Airport regulation for the 21st century. Thanks very much. It's been a, a great time. Mm -hmm.